All right, what's going on fam? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you guys can hear me on this microphone. Let me know in the comments section below if you can hear us correctly. Um, this is one of my closest friends from back home who we've played together for God knows what, 10 years now? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Moombi, so he runs a training program called Elevate and he tries to get kids basically developing into the college game. So we'll talk a lot about the college game today. We'll talk a lot about how we made it from our high school uh, all the way, the varsity team, all the way up through to the pro ranks. And that's going to be kind of how it is. Um, so we'll jump really quickly into the intro. Roll it. <laughs> Almost rated twice. Okay. Uh, all right. So who, let's see, I need to figure out really quickly. So let's start really quick with um, a couple things. Why don't you go through like your story of Elevate? We get through some of the Elevate stuff and then we'll start talking about like career and all that. Yeah. So started Elevate back in 2020, right after basically the middle of the pandemic. Um, when everybody's at home, obviously, you know, kids aren't out on the field and, you know, mostly virtual training is going on at this point. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I have an impact? How can I help kids out? Um, and so that's when I kind of said, well, this is an opportunity for me to start working with kids. And yeah. this is an opportunity for me to start my own program. So I started with um, online mentoring. Um, and that's how I started to connect with kids, you know, all over the country, mm -hmm. um, the various places that I've played and been. And then as soon as I you know, got the opportunity and, and kind of restrictions went away. I was now working with kids in person. Yeah. Um, and then that, you know, extended to when I now left for the off season back to Seattle, I was then working with kids there. So yep. that's how the program started to take off. And, and I started to expand the program based on the needs that, you know, kids had, right. And, and what parents were telling me their kids needed. So for example, you know, there came a point where parents were saying, hey, do you know anything about college recruiting? And yeah. that's when I stepped into that as well. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously I'd, I'd been through the process. Um, I've, I've worked with college players before. Um, and so that was a good opportunity for me to say, okay, let me add to my existing program of right. mentorship and personal training. Yeah. So now it's really awesome to have basically three, um, you know, I would say pillars of what I do, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about the consulting, which is like career yeah. advice. When we talk about, um, you know, specifically college recruiting, talking about mentorship with this, which is character development. And then you're talking about um, coaching. So mm -hmm. training on the field um, that might be game analysis. It could be personal training sessions. So that's yeah. kind of how I've created the business from 2020 till now. Fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. For those of you who are on right now, it looks like there's about 18, 20 people watching um, what questions do you have for Moombi? So let me get this. As far as college recruiting goes, um, what are the things that you want to know? Leave them in the comment section below and we'll start to answer them. Uh, mm, epic. Cool. I appreciate you. It says goat, uh, SOS. Let's go. That's cool. I'm going to mispronounce this. Josty. Elite, Elise and Jossie, most underrated. I appreciate that. Let me know how you pronounce your name because I would love to know. Um, Leo Suarez, do you prefer Phantom GX highs or lows? That is a question for a different live stream. We're not talking about boots on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, so for the college recruiting process, leave them in the comment section below. So let's see, do you know the process, how the process works for recruiting from overseas? That is a great one. So let's start there. Okay. Um, so yeah. So overseas. That's an awesome question. So there's a couple of different ways to go about the process. If you're overseas, um, specifically, if you're trying to come to the U.S., there's a couple of things you need. Obviously, you need to have interest. Um, there's a couple of ways to get that interest. So maybe you are connecting with an agency. There's lots of agencies that are basically taking internationals and connecting them to college coaches. Um, tons of colleges all around the U.S. have internationals, and so depending on their resources, they you know they have the money and they can sort out visas and stuff. Those are the schools that obviously you'd be looking at. Um, there's a way for you to, you know, get in contact with coaches individually. Um, there are programs that have the resources to sort out your visas um, without you going through like a third party, like an agency. So it really just depends. There's a, a ton of different ways. Um, if you, you know, email, message a college coach, um, 
if you know their athletic program has the budget and they have the resources, they can help you directly. If they don't, then maybe they'll find that third party, like I said, um, or they'll try to hire someone or work with someone that maybe knows that process and understands that process to get you over if they really want you as a player. So that's a great option. Do you are you somebody who works with overseas clients? As of right now, I haven't. I'd be very much open to doing it, um, but yeah, it's something that I would I would absolutely love to do if if the opportunity came up. So awesome. Um, so another question that we got right away, um, Andrew Palmer, great to see you in the chat. I know we've gone back and forth several times. Uh, so does college recruiting have any difference based on region in the United States? So less about the geographical region. And I would say more about the division, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. obviously you have your NCAA, you have your NAIA, and then you have your national junior college, right? AA, right? And so for me, I would say that those would be where you would find the differences is between those levels um, and not so much the geographic region um, because you could be on, you know, looking at D1 schools um, and whether they're East Coast or West Coast, they might operate the same. They might operate different. It really just depends. Um, And then the other thing I would say is that depending on a school's resources, a coach's resources, that might also dictate how they go about the recruiting process. So for example, there are some college coaches that um, don't have, you know, they don't have the budget to do a ton of recruiting outside of their state. So for example, those are coaches who are saying, okay, well, we mainly recruit local players because of our budget, right? Then there's some coaches who can recruit outside of their state because they have the money and the backing to do that. So it really just depends. Like it's, it's not just about Uh, I would say geographic region, but something I would say that is important is that if you're an in-state player, then it costs less typically Mm -hmm. than if you're an out-of-state player, right? So that's something to to keep in mind. So Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for, especially for recruiting at the division one and division two levels, correct me if I'm wrong, for the D3 school that I went to, there was no ability to get athletic scholarships either and so that plays as well a part Mm -hmm. into sort of the financial ramifications of choosing a school in state and out of state as well yeah 100 percent. so on that note like if you're obviously playing ncaa division three the only money that you're going to get is going to be academic money so if you don't have the best grades i wouldn't be i wouldn't suggest looking at d3 as your main option just because the fact that you're not going to get any uh scholarship money from soccer right so yeah. if your grades are really good then you can get a lot more there was a kid that i worked with this last year who um playing division three right now just finished his freshman year he got about thirty four thousand dollars in scholarship per year um and so that's because wow. of his grades and so yeah it was it was really incredible he did an amazing job in the recruiting process he also had really good grades i think we're he gonna finished, we're gonna answer this right perfect. Now. yeah, yeah. <laughs> his grades were awesome he finished high school i think with a three six and he told me he missed out on money because he was like oh man i could have had a three seven and that would have given him an additional five ten thousand dollars so wow i didn't realize it was that high yeah he got thirty four thousand dollars per year per year per year guaranteed for four years yeah as long as he keeps God. his grades up right so that's right. also part of the conversation is yeah. you have to maintain your grades right getting in is one thing it's excellent if you can get in and get that type of scholarship money but you know make no mistake if you fall below a certain standard with your grades then they can take scholarship money away yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um that's amazing honestly props to him for getting that sorted um okay so is it easier to get recruited in the in the states or overseas europe etc specifically for college soccer is that the... i think we let's answer it both ways okay let's answer it both ways um if we're going to start with college soccer um 100 like if you're if you're in the u.s i would say that it's easier not because of any particular bias for american players just because you're here does that make sense it's it's so much harder to go to another country and find something um you know coaches their immediate network is here uh, it's in your state like most coaches don't really even have to leave you know, their side of the country to to recruit players. Some coaches really have to leave their state to recruit players. So if you're a local player, if you're here, it's so much easier. Um, And and that's just the honest truth, just based on the fact that, I mean, there's there's schools everywhere, but not many schools are, you know, if you look at the scale, not many schools are really pulling in internationals from around the world. I mean, it's becoming more common, sure. But the majority of players in the American college system are 
American players. Yeah. Um, but there is an influx of foreign players now, especially as you know, schools and programs start to get more money. Yeah. But yeah, it's so much easier if you're here. Um, and if you're overseas, hopefully you have a good connection or hopefully, um, you know, there's an agency that, that connects you. Um, yeah. and, and that's a way to get over here as well, but much, much harder. Yeah, it seems like at the top level of Division One, and then also at the NAIA yeah. level, yep. those are kind of the two places that you see the most international yeah. players mm -hmm. from abroad. Yeah. Um, I know a couple, I mean, we both know a couple of guys who played at the top D1 level, and yeah. there were international players on those teams yeah. as well that came from the Chelsea Academies, mm -hmm. the Madrid yeah. Academies, you mm -hmm. know, things like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, and then is it easier to get recruited in the States or overseas? Now let's talk about a little bit kind of moving into the pro game. We'll get back to some of the um, comments. I appreciate a lot of you who are in here. Um, speaking of playing in England, uh, I have never played in England, no. Have you? No, okay. never played in England. Uh, it's cool. So we'll get back to here. So getting recruited overseas versus domestically, I would assume, as a player into the professional game, I would mm -hmm. say it's much easier to get recruited in your home country. 1,000%. Yeah. yeah. And that and that comes down to, and, and we can kind of riff off each other here, but like yeah. for, for me, the top things I think about are number one, housing situation is much easier to sort for domestic players. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, you, you know, working visas is a huge one. Yeah. Visas tend to be kind of the say, biggest yeah. thing. Yep. Um, that's affected both of us in, mm -hmm. in Europe. And that's, that's what I mean by, you know, playing, uh, overseas as an American player or playing overseas kind of as any nationality, it's it's very difficult when you're trying to break into those leagues and you mm. really have to, at some level, it's luck and, and connections. But I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of different ways that you can get um, in, into those leagues if you have, again, the connections and all that stuff. Otherwise, as a U.S. player, if you don't have a foreign passport, you don't have an EU passport, you don't have a South American passport, it's mm. very difficult to get into foreign leagues. Yeah. yeah. Anything to add on that one? No, you're spot on. Cool. Spot on. Cool, cool. Um, okay. What age do you think you need to start putting together game footage to send to college coaches? This is a fabulous oh, question, yeah. Trill. I appreciate you very much for this. Okay, go for it. So I would say the start of your freshman year, um, because obviously by your senior year, the, uh, coaches have a pretty good idea of where you are developmentally. Mm -hmm. So if you can show them, this is what I'm like in my freshman year, this is what I'm like in my sophomore year, this is what I'm like in my junior year, then coaches have a pretty good idea um, of, of who you are as a player, uh, what qualities you have. And, and you got to think about this, that coaches are, um, they're, they're very particular about the kinds of players that they want to bring in. They, they have an idea of, of what style they want to play. And so if you can show them certain qualities, um, you know, consistently from, again, your freshman to junior, beginning of your senior year, um, you know, then that's that's a that's a good way to, to get recruited. So I would say as soon as you can start collecting video, if it's your freshman year, then that would be great. Um, sophomore year at the latest, I would say for sure. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, yeah. Let's jump down to here because I think this can kind of yeah. go into Andrew is hitting bombs with these questions, man. This is awesome. So do you also help women's players as well? And if so, are there any drastic differences in the college recruitment process? Maybe we can touch first on the um, sending film first, and then you can kind of go into like yeah. what what the differences are in recruiting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, in terms of sending film, it's it's pretty similar between you know the boys side and the girls side. Um, it's something that's really important for players to do if they have access to game film, mm -hmm. um, especially for players though that are playing in in now. You're talking about the ECNL, the the GA, and and MLS Next. Like these players typically have access to film, right? These sure. programs are so expensive. There's a lot of money they have film. Um, so what I would say is, um, yes, I also have worked with uh, women's players. The process is a little bit different. Um, typically, girls tend to commit earlier uh, in the process. So as soon as college coaches can um, can identify players, right, like especially at the D1, D2 levels, then they go for them. Um, I, I've seen girls commit as soon as, you know, they're, you know, early junior year, yeah. um, as soon as college coaches are, are basically allowed to, to contact them. Um, you know, they, they connect with coaches um, and they have a pretty good idea of, of these players, especially when they see you play uh, multiple times. Uh, if you're, you know, playing at the, like I said, ECNL GA levels uh, as a girl or as a boy playing at the MLS next or ECNL levels, you're going to so many events a year that these coaches, you know, have a pretty good idea of who they want to recruit and what they're looking for. So, yeah. 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 No, it's crazy. We had a, McKenna, who I think you have met before, mm -hmm. she, um, shout out McKenna, by the way, uh, wonderful human being. So she played at Seattle Pacific University, which is a D2 college. In high school, when I was coaching her high school team, she, one of the girls that they played against was recruited by 
several division one, like top end division one schools, Wazoo, Stanford, UCLA, like a lot of these West coast schools by the end of her freshman year, like they were starting to yeah. start those conversations. So yeah, it, it can be earlier as well. It can um, be earlier. Typically, obviously there's, there's a list of rules and regulations of yeah. when coaches can make contact with you depending on the division. Um, but in general, they, they do recruit pretty early on the girls side. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. That difference is uh, important to know. So if you do, if you guys do know any female players, I'm sure you also help them as well. Yep. So mm -hmm. hit, hit them up. Here we go. We'll, we'll go back to uh, IG really quickly. Go follow. Where is it? Right here. Go follow Perfect. Elevate Training Program. Appreciate you all. So let's go again, boot questions. I apologize. Those are not going to make it today just because we're going to talk mostly about career stuff and we'll move into the pro game a little bit later, but I really wanted to start with that college recruiting process because I think it's a really important piece of uh, a lot of people's um, careers in general. So mm -hmm. maybe we just go here and this is something that I kind of came up with as a topic we can talk about. So how important is college soccer for going pro? And then we'll jump back into the comments as well. Yeah, I, I would say you and I have talked about this a lot. It depends what's accessible to you, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you were telling me the other day about working with um, a Sounders Academy player who has an offer on the table to play yeah. for Tacoma Defiance, right? right? And turn pro at 16. We didn't have those opportunities, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily because we weren't good enough. Um, I think we had room to grow for sure, but because those structures weren't in place. Yeah. Um, when we were 16 and 17, it made sense to go to college. Right. That was the route because there were no solid – um, division three leagues with, yeah. with links in our area, at least in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had the Sounders, but that was it. Um, right. And all the top players, even in the Sounders Academy, were going to college. Right. Um, you know, even a great example, people know the name, obviously Jordan Morris, national team player. He went to Stanford for a few years um, mm -hmm. before he, um, you know, signed for the Sounders. So now that the structures are in place, it's a little bit easier for kids to make the jump, specifically if they're in an MLS academy or if you're in a USL academy, maybe to play uh, mm -hmm. for, for a club uh, directly out of high school. But, you know, the logical step for, for players uh, in their development, again, we're talking about how easy it is to, to start here at home versus going abroad. College just makes sense for that reason. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, how much it costs, maybe not so much sometimes. Yeah. Like, I, But I don't know, your parents were maybe similar to mine. It was really important for me to go to college, um, you know, and, and and get a degree. And so that's what I did. And it was also an opportunity to play. So mm -hmm. that's what made the most sense for me, at least. And I think your sure. story is probably similar. Yeah, I mean, a, a quick rundown, I guess, of our the way our careers have kind of overlapped. So we played youth soccer up until the age of, I guess, 18. Yeah. Um, we crossed over for three years in high school. We played on the varsity team in, uh, for three years in high school. And then we, you went to school in Florida first yep. and then moved over to Humboldt in yep. California. Um, he's one year older than me. So I, the next year I went to Whitman College, which is a small D3 school on the West Coast for four years. Then you went to Spain. I met you in Spain. We played there for a couple months. I had to go home because of visa issues again. Um, and then you left a couple months later or six months later after yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And then we're playing in kind of different leagues for a couple years uh, in, in the professional game here in the U.S. And then I went to Australia and then we came back and are now playing for Flower City Union together. Yeah. So that's kind of how if there's any questions based on sort of that trajectory of us on either end. So whether it's Australia playing, if it's U S college soccer, if it's, you know, playing in California or Florida, please don't uh, hesitate to ask uh, anything there. Jerome, I appreciate you. That's a cool uh, little avatar. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, have you ever played in Europe? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I've played in Denmark and in Spain. And, mm -hmm. and then I've played a season in Spain. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for no goat. I appreciate that. That's a funny fit. That's a really cool one too. That's funny. Uh, again, apologies about the boot content. We're going to cover that probably later this week. We'll do another a boot related. I'll do a boot related one. And we'll, I'll show you guys what's in the, what's in the closet. Here's a great one. Aiden. Um, very cool. I like that celebration is starting to take soccer seriously at 16 playing low league team too late to start uh, to strive for a college soccer scholarship. Now, my two cents worth is no, it's not too late. Mm -hmm. So long as a couple factors are happening as soon as you, <clears throat> my, my thing is as soon as you decide to do something, it has to be all in. And this, especially at 16, 
you're playing lower level, you got to go all in. If you're going to make it in the next two years, my two cents worth is you got to be pushing for, you got to be training every day. Obviously you take a day off once a week. I made that mistake. So yeah. So take a day off uh, once a week, but you should be training your ass off, making sure you're getting lots of good nutrition. You're working with and networking as much as you possibly can with college coaches, with any sort of people at school. So getting the academic help you need to get your grades up. If your grades are already up, then you're, you're golden there. Um, continue to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it should be, it, it literally, your life should become training and uh, anything revolving around footy and then everything revolving around networking and, and grades. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible. It's going to be really difficult. That's, that's kind of an obvious one. I think it's not yeah. going to be, it's not going to be easy. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is really, really important that if you do decide to do it, my, my two cents worth is you go a hundred percent balls to the wall. Yeah. And, the, and what I would add to that as well is you and I've talked a lot about process. I'm sure it's going to mm -hmm. come up later in mm -hmm. the, the call, but yeah, I think striving for um, a spot on a college roster is 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 a good place to begin. Mm. You might be playing college soccer and not be on a soccer scholarship, if that makes sense, right? Totally. So, you know, there's only so much scholarship money that a school has. Um, you know, no program has unlimited amount of money. So, you know, say, for example, what I can break down is if a soccer program is given – 10 full scholarships, right? Say you have 25, 30 guys on the team, the coach has to decide, hey, how am I gonna split up this money uh, amongst my players, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, you might have you know, a senior foreign player, let's come back to that conversation, who mm -hmm. is, because they're coming from abroad, um, maybe they're bringing a certain level, maybe they came through Prime Academy, La Liga Academy, like yeah. they're at a really, really good level, um, may potentially go pro, that player might be on a full soccer scholarship, right? Um, and then maybe there's a couple other guys that are that are local that are at, that played MLS level academy, mm -hmm. and they're also on full scholarship. Um, then from there, there's going to be quite a few guys that are on partial scholarships, right? Yep. So that those can range. It can be you know anywhere from maybe a thousand to two, three, four thousand, but it's not a full scholarship. So it really just depends. I think the goal should be to find a coach that believes in you, mm -hmm. that that appreciates your qualities as a player. Find a school that that fits what you want to study um, and that you think is going to help you become, um, you know, obviously reach your reach graduation. If that's a goal for you, I yeah. don't know. Everyone's different. Um, and then finding a place to live that that is ideal for you, that fits your personality, a place where you feel like you can explore and grow as a person. So for me, it's those three things like it's not just about getting a scholarship to play soccer. Because again, if you have good grades, you could get a full scholarship academically. Right, right. Right. And that takes care of it. And then at that point, what's a so soccer scholarship really mean to you and what's it for? For sure. Um, because at the end of the day as well, soccer scholarship also doesn't mean that you're also being picked to play every week. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're more important or less important or that you're a captain. That's not what it's about. And so for me, I would just say be very clear and intentional about what it is that you're striving for. And for me, a scholarship for soccer is not mm. – you know, that, that's not the biggest thing you should be going for. Because for me, like, I got a little bit of scholarship money for soccer. Mm -hmm. um, not in Miami, in, in California, humble. Yep. But it didn't change. It didn't change much for mm -hmm. me. Obviously, it was more convenient for my family. But sure. it didn't change much. Yeah. The way I had it described to me one time is a college coach looks at it like a like a puzzle piece mm -hmm. or like a big puzzle. Yeah. So if, if you and I are coming from, um, say – we're both coming from the US. We both have US passports. It's it's just a matter of how we fit in to the team, what they have left over for scholarship money. Yeah. And it's actually easier. And here's the other thing. This is this is one thing we were talking about grades earlier. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier if you have better grades. Because if there's a coach that has two different if let's say you and I are on the same level, we play the same position, same or year, same yeah. year, everything. And Moonbee's got way better grades than me. Number it does two things. Number one is it's much easier to, for you to get into the school, period, 100%. like yeah. without soccer. Uh -huh. And number two, what it does is if you can get if the soccer coach can go to the administration and say, "Hey, this player has really good grades. Can we reward him by giving him scholarship money?" Extra more. What that does is that relieves pressure so that he can take that money and give it to somebody who is a, an elite talent who doesn't have the grades, who's right. way better than both of there us. There you go. Right? You try like, to balance it out, exactly, 100%. and that's what coaches have to do. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, that's a big one for you guys to keep in mind. And that's, again, why we come back to like, 
are grades important? Like, like are grades important in your soccer career? If you're going to go to college soccer? Yes. Yeah. Big 100%, time. Yeah. Cause Big if you time. don't have the grades, you, you don't even get into the school. Um, and, yeah. and if, if a coach doesn't know that at the beginning of the process, whenever they find that out, it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to work out. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember being at the uh, MLS Next Fest. I the didn't want to didn't want to confuse them because there's a flex and there's a fest. The flex just happened in Maryland. The fest was in uh, Palm Springs in December. Okay. So at that uh, tournament, I spoke to a coach um, at the D1 level, mm-hmm. and uh, he was staying at the hotel that I was in. Um, and just at breakfast one day, just happened to you know meet him and, and we started to talk and and he basically shared his uh criteria for what he's looking for when he recruits gotcha. and so essentially at these events every squad um has a whatever you want to call it, pamphlet or brochure of the player profiles mm-hmm. right and the player profiles are, are they share obviously your your position everything all your soccer attributes and then also your school stuff so your grades sat act scores right um and if he sees a player that's not at a certain level, the school he, you know, he coaches for is a pretty rigorous program academically. He crosses a kid out right away if their grades aren't up to par. Yep. So that's something to be aware of is that a lot of coaches, if they see your grades and it's like it's too low, then they have to move on to the next player. And it doesn't even matter how good you are. Mm-hmm. Um, some coaches, um, I have seen this and you've seen this as well with players that we grew up with that are good enough. If there's a D1 school that, that, that wants you and they're really invested in you, what they might do is they say, hey, come to a local junior college or community college in our yeah. area, yeah. get your grades up, and you can train with us or transfer and move over mm-hmm. as soon as you finish that semester that year. Yeah. Um, so that happens sometimes in certain cases, but the coach really has to be invested in you as a player because if you then spend a year, two years, and you don't get your grades up, then you're pretty much done at that point. For sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's an important one. So, again, get good grades if you, if you want to go play. So here's a great one. Um, and Aiden, thank you for that question. I appreciate that. So uh, what should you email coaches? That's a good one. That, I guess it depends on may, maybe let's do three different three different phases of the recruitment process. Okay. Let's go let's get cold email first. Okay. And then we'll go. They have expressed interest. Okay. And so now you're starting that conversation. And the third scenario is going to be there. They're like trying to lock you in. You've been, okay. you've already applied and you're just doing that process. Yeah. So that's, yeah, we'll go through those three. Okay. So let's start with the cold and then, then you can introduce the second one again. So the, the cold call or the cold email would be, you basically need to give them a couple things that, that you can't go without. So obviously give them your full name. You want to give them your GPA. You want to give them uh, what club team you play for obviously what position you play. Um, you want to give them uh, your graduating year. Um, you want to give them a highlight video if you have one. You want to give them a recruiting profile if you have one. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to give them, if it makes sense and, it, and it's timely, the schedule of your next game or event um, that you're attending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so those are the, the main things that I would put in that first email, like the, the cold email, okay. the outreach email. Yeah. Perfect. So next, email to a coach who's already expressed interest. Mm-hmm. You're you might be talking to multiple coaches at the time. Yeah. How do you go about that? Yeah. So it depends what they say, right? Um, you know, I've worked with players who, you know, a coach has just outright said, "Hey, like I really want you. Um, I think you'd be a great fit for my program, and you know, come on an official visit." So, for example, if that's the step that that they want to take, then it's up to you to obviously schedule that official visit with your parents um, to get to the campus and obviously see what they have to to, to offer. And um, that's obviously the next biggest step. And obviously, that's the you know one of the last steps that you would take. Um, so, if I want to backtrack, though, one of the things they might say is, "Hey, I want your game schedule because I want to come see you play again in person." Huge one, right? So that's a huge one. Is yeah. is if they've seen you play at an ID camp already, or they've seen you play a game. Or two, they might want to see you play a couple more times. The recruiting process is rarely done in in a month or two. Yeah. The, the recruiting process typically takes, I would say, typically anywhere from for the average player like six months to twelve months. Yep. Right. Uh, of of communication, of figuring out your personality. They want to figure out okay your playing style. They might talk to your coach or your club director. Yep. Um, they might have to see you play in person a couple times. Every coach is different in their process. Sure. They might say, oh, I need to see a couple more highlight videos. It really just depends. So 
depending on the level of interest they express. And if you're talking to other coaches, then you would figure out, okay, when's the next opportunity to see me play? Mm -hmm. um, and then what's the next steps from there? You, my, That's a question to ask them is, okay, well, yeah. what do you need to see from me next? Um, sure. Or, or let's follow up, but you know, where do you see me in the process? Those are good questions to ask a college coach because then you get a feel for how they really see you. There are some coaches that might say, um, well, let's hold off um, on an official visit because um, I want to keep watching you play. Yeah. Um, something they may not tell you is they might hold off on an official visit or on coming to see you play just because maybe you're lower on the list of recruits that they have for that year for that position. Maybe. Sure. So that's also something to consider. Um, and that's something you might not know. It's out of your control. So don't worry about it. But there's different reasons for why a college coach um, may have you at different you know, places of, okay, come on a visit or I need to see you play again, or um, maybe they haven't responded in a while, but then they get back to you after two weeks. It, it just depends. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Uh, final and third one, email communication to a coach where you've already applied. So a school you've already applied to, you potentially, you know, if you've applied, you probably want to go there. Yeah. Uh, how do you communicate with that coach now that you've already sent that application in? Yeah. Well, so assuming that they want you to commit, um, the last thing is you're asking the coach, what else do you need from me on my end to, to make this work? Um, obviously by this time, um, again, if you've applied, um, you're waiting to hear back on, on whether you've been accepted or whether you've been waitlisted, whatever that process is. Yep. Um, at this time, you're also figuring out you know, communicating about, for example, scholarship money. Mm. Um, so this is a situation where, for example, let's say you've been accepted and you're given a certain package and they'll email and say, hey, you've been accepted. We'd like to offer you this scholarship, this scholarship, and this scholarship for a total of whatever, right? Yeah. Um, this is the moment where you say to the coach, for example, coach, actually, and I had the situation um, this last year in this recruiting cycle, there was a player who was talking to a coach and said, uh, I think I need a little bit more money, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so that was a situation where, you know, they were trying to figure out and communicate, okay, based on your grades, let me get back to you, the coach said, on can I get you five, ten thousand more dollars? Right. And so that's some that's a situation that can sometimes happen is hey, you know, my parents, we have a budget, we have an idea of what we want to do for college yep. in terms of how much you want to pay out of pocket, because college is obviously very expensive. So if you can help us with an extra five, ten thousand, that would be great. Or, you know, however we can get that get that money. So that's the stage yep. where you're kind of negotiating you know, things like scholarship money. Um, and, and that's where you start to, you know, figure out those kinds of details, because obviously that's a, that's a big factor in, in deciding schools. Yeah. Like finances. That's money. Uh, yeah. for you guys who, uh, are new, go follow movie. I want to make sure this gets plugged because right here, go follow on Instagram. Cause he's got a ton of expertise posts pretty much every day. And also yeah. you can sign up for his program, get some mentorship because yeah. that's, that's where it's at. Uh, okay. So let's get into, 12 turtles. What's up, dude? All right. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Mm, epic cool again. I'm from Australia and have an EU passport. What country do you think would be best to try and go pro in? I'll go ahead and hit that. Yeah. Yo, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, lucky you for having both types of passports. So first off, I would try to get in the highest NPL. If you're in Australia right now, get to the highest level NPL <laughs> you possibly can. So NPL in Victoria, NPL in New South Wales, any of those are going to be money. So that's the first, that's the first thing you want to do. The The second thing I would say is depending on your age and you can either let us know in the comments or, you know, we can kind of assume potentially pre pro age. So anywhere between 14 and 20 years old, yeah, maybe somewhere. Um, somewhere in there. So assuming you're around that age, again, top NPL, you should be balling out because you're going to get much better looks in both the Southeast Asian market. And then I know a lot of guys who are Australian who have now gone into, especially the UK, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of crossover there. Sure. Um, okay. 16. Awesome. Oh, Beautiful. Perfect. That's a yeah, great age. Um, so for me, again, top NPL. And then the next thing I would start to do is look into, can you get connected in the country of your other passport first? Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Yeah. Um, obviously the EU has special rules around football. I'm not totally familiar with what all of those are, but my, my first thought is go to the country where your other passport is. And then you can try to build up in through the semi-pro and the pro divisions there. And that would be, that would be my two cents worth. Yeah. 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 And then I, I would agree with that. And I would say that at that age, especially if you're 16, depending on when you're choosing to make this jump, uh, I, I'm assuming sometime in the next three, four years, go somewhere where you're going to play. 
Yeah, yeah. Find a place to play, play games because, I mean, it's all well and good to go sign for, you know, a big club somewhere if, if you're able to, whether that's through connections or someone scouts you and sees you. But it, it, it almost means nothing if you're not playing games because that's where your development comes from. Um, and, and that's the best way to move forward in the game is by playing games. Um, if you're sitting on the bench at a young age, it's really, really difficult. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. Game time is is everything. Yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Let's move on. Moses says, "What is it like playing in Spain versus other countries?" This is a great one. Why don't you hit this one first, and then I'll follow. Yeah, I, I think I would mainly compare obviously the Spain Spain to the U.S. Um, and what I would say is the game is is bigger than a game in Spain. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'd say is that it, it's a part of, it's deeply rooted in their culture. Um, it's deeply rooted in, in the people there. And so everywhere I looked, everywhere I walked, I saw the game. And that's so different than here in the US, for example, um, because being here, you have baseball, you have basketball, you have football. Yeah, Like soccer is not the football soccer is not the top <laughs> sport in, in yeah. this country it, it's just not in terms of culture and also in terms of um just it, i would say the the way that uh it, it's it's marketed like it, it's not at the top yeah. um but in other countries that's 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 the only thing that they have right so over there like you saw people that were in love with the game that 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 um breathe the game um, so the understanding of the game is on a different level and, and obviously you experienced this over there with me, yeah. but the understanding of how to play the game is so different. Um, totally. here in the U S I think there's a big emphasis on the physical side of the game. Mm -hmm. So are you fast? Are you big? Are you strong? Um, and those things only take you so far, but in Spain, what I saw was that, you know, obviously at lower levels that still exists where physicality yeah. is big, but ultimately the players and the, the teams, the groups that are, that are, I think a notch ahead have a mix of those things, right? Mm. But especially more so are players who are intelligent. Right. Regardless of size, I saw so many players who I'm like, wow, these guys are unbelievable. And, and I told you about this experience, but I remember playing A-Bars um, 13, mm -hmm. right? And then for, for those of you who know, maybe A-Bars a, a big team in the Basque country. And um, they went through, you know, Pro Rel, all, they went through the levels and they jumped into La Liga. Um, and at that time, their first team was doing really well. Um, and so I was playing in a team that that played against their third team, and it was the best team I've ever played against. Yeah. The, the, just the intelligence, the the way that they played, the style, um, every player so comfortable and calm on the ball. Um, they could go long and direct. Mm -hmm. They could they could play short. Like, they built from the back. Like, it, they played between the lines. Like, it was unbelievable. And so I really saw a different side of the game there because I saw an appreciation for a different side of the game besides just physicality mm -hmm. like the tactics were unbelievable at times um i would say the coaching the information you received so it was it was just different um yeah. it, it was it was a very eye-opening because i learned a lot at 22 23 in spain that i didn't learn in the u.s that i probably should have learned right um you know i'd go out to training sessions and watch kids and i'm like they're being taught things at eight nine years old that i was taught at like 18 yeah so they're 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 really ahead of the game and in some ways i talk to my brother he says oh they're playing a different game they really are at yeah. times 100 percent. So. yeah i mean my 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 short version is technically and tactically they're far superior than the majority of the american players that's just how yeah. like from a younger age just average they're much more so you have to be willing to either be so much more athletic than them mm -hmm. that it you know, kind of evens itself out at some point, but intelligence always wins in football. And so that's where, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, you really have to learn super quickly. Um, the differences between say Spain and Australia, Australia is much more, there are teams obviously that play very possession based, but a lot of them are very um, functional possession. So it's very direct possession. It's very uh, more English style. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. that's how I would compare it to Australia when I played there. Denmark, I would say, I don't really know if they had a particular style. I don't, that's, that's not meant as an insult. I just simply mean like maybe the team I was on wasn't, you know, uh, we wasn't good enough to be at that level. I mean, it was, it was a good team, but again, like, uh, not, a, not as much what they, we tried to play a little bit, but it wasn't as, uh, fluid, I would say as Spain, where Spain, there was like very clear ideas tactically and stuff that were, that mm -hmm. were implemented. Um, 
Yeah, that's a great question though. Moses, I appreciate it. Uh, so let's see, could you, let's see, let's do this one. Uh, Trill asked, do you, you need to live on campus to play college soccer or you don't have to? I don't think you have to, unless it's a requirement by the school. So mm -hmm. like our school was small enough where the first two years, the first two years, unless you had, you were in a fraternity or a sorority, the first two years you had to live on campus mm -hmm. after that, it was whatever, but there are school, there are schools all over the country that don't, you don't have to live on campus any time. So yep. yeah, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty straightforward there. Um, Thomas, welcome. How important is it to film yourself in practice games, et cetera? That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would say uh, Moonby kind of alluded to it earlier with some of the academies now that have, that are, you know, the, the VO program, some of the, what are some of the other huddle. video huddle, yeah. all these programs are getting much more common and also much more affordable. And so they're becoming a part of a lot of the academy systems and the DAs, yeah. the ECNLs, all those, you know, MLS next, all that stuff in the United States. But I would say the more you can film yourself and the more you can analyze your gameplay, the more you can talk with your coach about it, uh, the, the better. I mean, that's it's the same way that, you know, we Mumbi and I sit down and analyze video and, you know, my game analysis videos are like that. You know, that's that's not only for you guys to look and see where the pro level is at, at, you know, the third division in America, but it's also for it's personally just a selfish type of video because I get to go in and analyze my own stuff, yeah. which is super important for improvement. And that way you can kind of gauge where you're you don't you know again we talk a lot about process and maybe this is like where we can really step into that yeah kind of theme um but the, the the process of growing into your next stage in football requires you to be very deep into your process so mm -hmm. that means nutrition that means psychology that means game analysis and and film that means your technical and tactical training that means your gym work and your prehab and it, it really is a holistic type of as you move forward and, and you move up levels it's really important so you know again this is a very long-winded answer the short answer is film as much as humanly possible of what you play mm -hmm. and i would prioritize if you only can prioritize a few things games then training games then training sessions with your team and then individual sessions i would say individual filming individual sessions is like you might as well just start a youtube channel at that point you know which lol but uh <laughs> but like yeah. that would be my hierarchy mm -hmm. yeah i agree oh and then maybe above that is watch pro games like above everything mm. yeah so, so. that's kind of that's kind of my two cents uh jimmy i see your question we are not going to go over boot stuff. I said it earlier. We're, we're focusing today on career and college stuff. Ooh, ZPS just also set up, man, so many boot questions. Yeah. This is, this is a lot of my audience. Though, to yeah. be fair. Um, okay. This is a good one. Uh, could you explain the process of how you guys made it pro in Spain? Is it similar to the process just explained on college application? I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll make this one short because th it's a it's a really long story. Um, so how I'll shorten it is that Noah and I had a personal connection in how we got to Spain. Um, and so that's obviously a way that you can get to another country is is if you have a personal connection, someone that you know that's a, that's established in that country that's working. Um, it happened to be um, someone that we'd come across here in the U.S. Um, at the youth level. And so that's how we got to Spain is, is that there was a um, – there was a company um, that was doing, um, uh, how would you describe the work? I would say that doing soccer tours. Um, yeah. Soccer tours. Facilitation. And facilitating soccer yeah. tours and, 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 you know, a company that has a residential academy, um, but run by um, Americans. And so that's how we arrived in Spain. So it was not similar at all to any kind of college Ooh. application. It was literally a couple texts and phone calls that, <laughs> got us over to Spain. So yeah, I would say it's a very, it was a very unorthodox way of getting over there, oh, yeah. like compared yeah. to most people who get into college or into college into yeah. professional setups from yeah. America. It was very, very, very unorthodox. Yeah. So uh, don't bank on our experience to no, get no, over no, to no, Europe. No. Although I will say here's, here's, some, here's a good one. All right. We're going to go over, uh, and Mark experience with a little uh, sunshine ticker. All right, so 
one thing this is how cool is this little band i'm learning this is my first live session so i appreciate you guys hanging in here uh this is really cool so no uh the denmark experience was interesting for and i'd like your take on this one as well i know we've talked about it a bunch yeah. but so the way that i looked at junior year is i was getting college paid for and so my thought was if i go abroad and i want to go play at a semi-pro professional level obviously can't get paid because of NCAA rules. However, if the money that I'm spending on college isn't more because I'm going abroad and I basically the, the tuition or whatever, all the scholarships, everything just transfers over to abroad. Why not go and try and find a place to play that'll give me a little bit of extra experience while also, by the way, our team doesn't have, D3 doesn't really have spring seasons. And so in the spring of junior year, I went abroad and I was able to play an eight months, a full season in Denmark as a, I, I would consider myself at the time to be a semi-professional only because I wasn't being paid, but it was a pro level team. Yeah. There you go. So that was sort of like a hack that I was able to play European football without going over there because I also had a little bit of school on the side through that university in mm. Denmark. So is that a viable way to get extra minutes? Is that, you know, is that kind of a way people should look at it? Potentially. Okay. It, it depends. Um, it really depends on what you can find. Um, there's, there's tons of programs now that are doing, for example, uh, gap year. Yeah. Where you can pay to, to be in an academy um, mm -hmm. and train year round. Um, I actually have a, a connection to an academy that does that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so International Development Academy, mm -hmm. I have a partnership with them and they do that kind of work where um, you can sign on for a year long program and you can go train in Valencia um, at their academy, at their facilities for a year, um, training every day, games on the weekend against La Liga sides and, and whatnot. Um, and that can be your life for a year, for example, a gap year after high school. Yeah. Um, so something similar to what you experienced. Um, and they have programs um, in the U.S., uh, in Valencia, uh, in Rome, and then in the U.K. Mm -hmm. So that's also something um, you can check out their Instagram uh, through my uh, page as well. So Sweet. Uh, Leo, I, or Leo, I apologize I didn't get to this one earlier. This is a great question. What is the difference in level between MLS Next and high school or college football so maybe let's go mls next and well okay i'm just gonna put it out there it is all relative based on region some L mls i mean mls next there are mls next programs that are as good and or better than some of the best european clubs at that age group mm -hmm. as we see in generation adidas cup and stuff some of the results there yeah there are also mls next academy teams that are garbage and, and I don't mean that as an insult to those teams. I just mean like th it's not comparatively. Based on, yeah, it's not based on quality. No. It's not. It's no. based on can you fill out, you talk about applications. Yeah. You, you, there's a certain number of requirements that you have to meet in order to be yeah. MLS Next. And so that's what that is, is that if you meet those requirements, you're MLS Next. It's not you play a tournament and you win the tournament and now you are MLS Next level. That's not mm -hmm. how it works. It's not a promotion relegation or – Yeah. Yeah. So – yeah, so that's I, I think again it's all it's all relative. Um, but I would say that for the most part, I would say MLS next is gonna be better than high school for sure. I would say the best MLS next teams are also better than some of the college teams in America as well. Mm -hmm. Just because the concentration of players at the top MLS next programs, we're talking like uh, you know, I know the Sounders U17 won Gen Adidas Cup. Yeah. a year ago yeah, like they're they're, they're, they're all there's like three national camp player camp players you know guys with national caps on that team mm -hmm. all of them are going division one full ride scholarship or like, into the second team or into the second Tacoma defiance, to, Tacoma defiance team, right yeah. so so there are mls next programs that are like that and then there are you know college programs who are getting a lot of normal high school players and stuff so you kind of look yeah. at those differences um again it's it's all everything's going to overlap a little bit but I would say for the most part, uh, MLS Next is sort of a big, if you imagine like a big bell curve, college programs are all on the high end of the MLS Next programs. High school soccer is on the low end of, or even away from those MLS Next. Is that, does that kind of make sense? Fair. Yeah. 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 So that, that's how I would compare the, the two. Um, okay. So there is two 
Two really quick ones from Michael Wilson. Michael, welcome. I appreciate you joining in. I'm 15 years old in the U.S. and just started taking soccer seriously. What should my first steps be? He follows. I've been playing soccer my whole life, but have also been playing other sports when I wasn't playing soccer. That's a that's a great question. It is. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to hit that? Yeah, one? I would say it really depends what you want to do in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you want to go? I, I always tell players when I'm working with players, I ask them you know, let's start with the end goal and work backwards. Yeah. So where do you see yourself in a year, two years, three years? And then that's what we use as, okay, that's your North star. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what do we need to do to get you to a place where you can have the opportunity to get there? Right. Yeah. Because obviously you and I both know this, when we talk about process, you can do a lot of things and, and be really, really good and diligent in your work. Doesn't mean you're going to arrive at at what you want just because 100%. it's so competitive. There's so many players out there that want what you want, yeah. right? So it depends, Michael. If you say, I want to play college soccer, okay, well, you're going to have to start doing the, you know, the, the habits and the behaviors that are going to get you to play in college soccer. So for example, you're going to have to Maybe you get fitter. You're maybe going to have to get stronger. You're going to have to 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 make sure that you're healthy. Maybe you're going to have to join a competitive club team. Uh, maybe you're going to have to start making connections um, with yeah. coaches um, and and emailing coaches and getting a highlight video. Like there's so many steps, and it's just like if you do all those steps, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to play college soccer, but it puts you on that path to playing college soccer. So it really depends, I would say, what your goal is. Um, so when you talk about you know what should your first steps be, I would say that really depends on what you want to do. Yeah. Um, if you say, I want to play in college, then some of the things that I just mentioned are things that you can do to take those steps to playing um, in college. Uh, and if you want to play pro, I would say focus on getting to college first, yeah. depending on where you are right now. Like, I don't know if, if you're playing MLS next and you're in an MLS academy, then maybe yeah. you're a little bit closer to the college game For and sure. the pro game. But if you're not playing at a competitive club level, then I would definitely say that you're most, you're most likely your next route would be college soccer. And that's what it seems like. My goal is to play soccer in college. Brilliant. Um, I will chime in yeah. and also say that my parents had me playing three. So I had to play three sports until I was 13. Yeah. So that's, I mean, yes, I played mostly soccer, football mm -hmm. for, for the majority of my childhood, but I was a competitive swimmer at a pretty high level. And then I also played basketball up until I was, uh, and ran cross country up until I was 13 or 14. So again, that's, you're, you know, that's only two years Delta from where you are now. And that's something to think about if you are somebody who wants to, you know, play college soccer, I think, you know, 15 to 18 years old, that's a lot of time. So you've got tons of time. Again, as we spoke about earlier, focus on your process, dive really deep into that process, make sure that all of your variables are covered. If you yep. have questions about how you want to kind of round out stuff and, and really make sure by round out, what I mean is you really want to make sure you're covering all your bases. You can hit either of us up on Instagram or on, you know, watch some of the videos on YouTube. If you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, or if you want actual coaching from somebody who helps people get to college soccer, his Instagram, we will throw it up again uh, as well. And this is very specific, Michael, to you, just because I know that you have um, probably more questions. So you can always talk, chat with Mumi one-on-one. -on -one. He's got a plethora of knowledge about the, the recruitment process. And I think this is why I wanted him on as well is because he adds a totally different dimension to the stuff that I normally talk about when it comes to college soccer. So that's, I, Michael, I would highly, highly recommend you go hit him up on Instagram and then go from there. Cause as a 15 year old, this, this is the guy you want to talk to when you have that much time, you know, I think, and, and time is on your, your, uh, your side, which is great. Okay. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this one. Uh, what is the worst injury in soccer? Anything that takes you out forever? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say anything yeah. that, that takes you out where it's like you either can't come back or it takes years and that, that yeah. happens to, to players. So yeah, I, I would say if we're, if we're not talking season ending injuries, head injuries, in my opinion, are the worst because that like most of the things that you have in your body that you get injured, uh, can, you can recover from mm -hmm. really bad head injuries. You don't come back from no. or It's very hard to come back from. So yeah. that's, that's where we're at now. Uh, one other really quick thing. Ooh, Chris is on Chris. What's up, dude, Chris Rico in the house. I am trying to get my girl to make the first team at Crossfire U10. Hey, Seattle guy. Yeah. Uh, nice. She was on the second team last year, but ended up making the third team. Got any advice on what I should do to make her get there? It's a great dude. Question, it's yeah. first of all, 
great to great to see you. Um, this is a fantastic question. I got to sit up straight so you can see my bloody face. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Uh, you are the you are the youth coach out of yeah, the two of us, yeah, so yeah. you've got you've got this one. Yeah, man, this is a it's a tough one. So I was literally just coaching U um, ten and U twelve in Palo Alto this last season, and I've been coaching U ten the previous seasons, like in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Um, I've coached high school at various levels, but for me, the biggest thing at U ten is I, I don't think it should matter what um, team um, your your girl is playing at, Chris. To be honest, because the biggest thing is two things. One, that she's having fun, right? That she's enjoying herself. And the second is that she's um, genuinely interested in, in playing. You know, I, I would say it for any kid that's eight or nine years old, I worked with kids this last year who um, there were one or two kids that ended up quitting and moving mm -hmm. on to something else because they didn't genuinely want to be there. They didn't enjoy it. Yeah. These were kids who, when I was coaching them, and, and obviously boys and girls are different, but it's still the same in theory that, you know, I was working with kids who, would be distracted at training like and then they would be taking away from other kids at training right like they they were goofing off and they just they, they didn't want to be there or i had kids that were like stand there mm -hmm. and just not move like mm -hmm. oh they don't want to be here they want to do something else so those are the conversations i had with parents so if your girl loves to play um you know she's having fun and she's generally interested then at eight or nine years old the focus shouldn't be on getting to the second team the first team the first the first thing is that Again, that she's enjoying the game and that she's, you know, she's generally interested um, yeah. because that's when you stay in the game longer. Right. Um, and it depends what she wants to do. So ultimately, for me, that's what I've seen a lot of kids get driven out of playing because of parents. Um, I don't know you, Chris. So I, you seem very supportive. You seem like you really care. And that's important. But. You know, I would say parents have to be very careful at pushing kids at eight and nine years old to make mm -hmm. a certain team just because it's so subjective, right? One coach sees your girl as a first team player, maybe in another club, maybe not Crossfire, and another coach sees your daughter as a second team or third team player. So it's really subjective. But then that's another, that opens up another can of worms because I'm not suggesting then just go jump to another club. It depends. Like I was just talking to some parents um, from the team I was just coaching in California about, mm. you know, hey, we want to move clubs, right? Mm. I mean, it's not just about me, the club I was with, and, uh, there was some things going on um, specifically with the younger age groups and it was tough. And so a lot of parents like, Oh, maybe do we switch clubs? And I said, first of all, like, again, are your kids enjoying it? Are they having yeah. fun? Generally interested. And for a couple of parents, it was an issue of, Oh, but my, my boy has friends on this team. Mm. That's so important at eight and nine yeah. years old. Like what are we trying to do at eight and nine years old? Right. Are, are we trying to have the kids win? Is it about trophies? Is it like, mm -hmm. for me, I think if they're having fun, if they have connections with, the, the girls that they're playing with or the boys that they're playing with, that's what's most important. So yeah. for me, it should be irrelevant at U10 what team uh, a kid is on. That's money right there. Chris, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, obviously, if you have any follow-up questions, leave them in the chat, but I, I really appreciate that question. So that's awesome. Uh, Christian M Ramirez, what's up, my guy? Uh, let's go Moses again. How much attention is focused on tactics in the MLS? Take that yeah. Uh, I mean, I haven't played in the MLS, so I don't really know, yeah. but I would assume, uh, I would assume quite a lot. I mean, at that, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. As you move up in football levels, the players just at a base level get physically better, tactically better, technically better. They're mentally better. Everything is a higher echelon. So as you move up and up and up and up, the base level of what your what tools you have to work with. Let's pretend I'm a coach. You know, let's say Mumbi and I are coaching a team at, at the MLS level. We're we're coaching the Seattle Sounders, and that the the base level of talent and and driven and discipline and all those factors we were talking about earlier are is already so high that at some level, yes, every player is going to need to improve certain, you know, technical things, maybe physical things if they get injured or whatever. But for the majority of the training sessions, oh, my guess, again, neither of us have played in the MLS, um, but it's all going to be tactical pretty much because that's what wins games at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's the way I would look at it. And again, I, I don't have MLS experience. I've never played there. Um, but that versus, you know, we're coaching, talk about a U10 team, right? Yeah. Like a U10 yeah. team is we're just trying to build the base level of skill and fun and yeah. camaraderie and friendship and all those things that go into, you know, a U10 team and stuff. So that's what I would say, you know, I know that's a massive difference from U10 to MLS, but it's like at, at some level at the highest professional level, you're not talking about 
well, okay, like you need to work on your right foot dribbling in this types of situation or one-on-one defending and attacking. That's sort of a given already. And then the tactics is what the coach brings to that silo of players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's what I, that's what I would say. Uh, Chris says, that's great, man. Thank you for the advice. Love it. Uh, This isn't in, there we go. There we go. (laughs) Thumbs up. Awesome. Appreciate you, Chris. Uh, Okay. Andrew again. Might be a good video idea. Tactics that you won't learn in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, that'd be a sick video idea. Yeah, but that, yeah, the, I mean, it is. But also, I was also gonna say it's just it's so broad. The country's so big. Yeah. So there's some places and some coaches that will teach certain tactics that you might find in other places. Yeah. Um, but then you also have to think you have to be well traveled and go see what tactics are being taught somewhere else, right? So, yeah. and then what. Yeah, what you find value in, I guess, or what you think works. Like right. I don't, I don't know. There, are, I think there. One of the things that we don't do a good job of sometimes in the U.S. is acknowledging, um, acknowledging the good coaches we have here, the good mm. systems and programs that we have here. I think there are good systems and programs, but sometimes we get into this idea of like, oh, let's go borrow what the Dutch are doing. Yeah. Let's go borrow what the Spanish are doing. Let's go borrow what the French are doing. Or, oh, for a couple of years, oh, what are the Brazilians doing? It's all dependent on your environment. Like, we can't be like the Brazilians. Yeah. I mean, you have a country, for the most part, that their best players are coming from the favelas. Yeah. And for us, that's a different sport. You're talking about American football and American basketball, yeah. that the kids that are coming from the projects and, and poor um, socioeconomic backgrounds are the ones that are rising to that to play a that those sports yeah. as a way to bring themselves and their families out of poverty mm-hmm. for us we have to figure out what it is for us yeah. and i don't think we have figured it out right. um and for right now our model compared to other countries i'll tell you is you know what i'm going to say is yeah. it's pay to play yeah so we got to figure out how do we get the most out of this current system because that's what we got whereas for other countries it's it's they have different priorities so yeah yeah no that's that's the way it is um so we are just let's see if there's any other comments uh, we're going to start to wrap things up because we are just eclipsed over an hour. That went by really quickly. Yeah, that was super awesome. Cool, yeah. uh, super cool for the first live, which is great. We'll do more of these. Uh, we meaning you and I will do more of them eventually. Yeah. Uh, I will be doing lives more often. I think this is a super cool platform and I'd love to play around with it. Talk about boots, talk about football, talk about the the pro game, all that stuff. If there's any other questions, leave them in the comments section down below. And it has been great hanging out with you all. We will, uh, as always, be awesome. Take care. I'll see y'all in the next video. (laughs) Where did... Uh Uh-oh. See ya.